And yep. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are, uh, colleagues. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today, and welcome to the event organized by the GPC TAS team on law and policy. My name is Martina. Uh, I'm the incoming chair of the TAS team uh, on behalf of UNHCR. And I'll be moderating the event today um, with the support of Cecilia Roselli, um, our colleague from NRC, who is the other co-chair of the TAS team. Um, before we start, um, let me quickly go over some of the ground rules uh, for this event. Um, and yeah, just to mention, so that this event will last uh, one and a half hour. Um, we invite you all to please mute your microphone when you're not speaking um, and make sure to turn your camera on when you do. Um, and we are really hoping that you will all engage uh, in this discussion. So please share your comments, your observations and questions in the chat throughout the event. Uh, and make sure please to send to all attendees so we can all uh, see and follow the discussion. Um, keep in mind that this event will be recorded and then the recording and a report from the event will be made available uh, over the next week or so. And finally, if you're tweeting about the event, remember to use the, the hashtag below a protection forum 2020. Now, I would like to go quickly through the agenda for today. Um, I hope we'll have uh, William connected. Is that so yeah so perfect so we will have some uh, welcome remarks uh, from uh, our gpc coordinator william shemali and this will be followed by an overview of the task team and its work uh, given by cecilia roselli from nrc we'll have some opening remarks uh, from dr chaloka beyani uh, who is uh, certainly our global champion of the idp law and policy um area of work and uh, we will have a fantastic panel uh, we will hear from the experiences of colleagues in niger honduras and ukraine and this will be followed by a plenary discussions with concluding remarks that will be offered by uh, corita tassi uh, from echo uh, and myself uh, on behalf of the task team now we look uh, forward to a fruitful uh, event with all of you, and I would just like to leave the floor to our GPC coordinator, then William uh, Shemali. William, to you. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me well? We can. Thank you, William. Very good. Uh, so here is the thing. If someone tells me that I have to open a session on law and policy for protection in the presence of Shaloka Biyani, I would have advised against it. What can one say that can add to the practical experience, the diplomatic uh, mastership and academic record that Biyani brings? Yet, here I am, stuck. So dear colleagues, partners, friends, Dear Professor Viani, please be kind with me. And big welcome to our session on leveraging law and policy for effective field responses. International protection is constant work in progress. It will always be. Each new generation of protection actors takes up the unfinished work of the last to carry it further, to build on the achievements of the past and attempt to fix the cracks. The challenge to our generation now, I see as a threefold. First, we continue to fight the same battles. Some hard fought wins of the past on the absolute basis that make the foundation of protection have been somewhat taken for granted. The inherent dignity and worth of every single human being is challenged by an age of harmful politics, practices, and crimes. While nothing new, international human rights law and humanitarian law is broken every day. The consistency and intensity of disregard for rule of law we see today in, in Yemen, in Syria, in Somalia, in Burkina, in 
Mozambique forces the question, how do we keep that law relevant? How do we keep it alive? The responsibility to protect the milestone in international protection work is hit every day by both deliberate and unintentional misconceptions. And somewhat, dare I say, de facto acceptance of its dissent. So that is the first challenge of for our generation. Reconfirm the basics every day. Second, the landscape and players have changed and are fragmented. The numbers of armed group is exponentially higher than that of member states. Hundreds of millions of civilians live under their authority. The respect for national and global law and for the lives for which they hold control vary widely from context to another. The dependencies of these armed groups and that to that effect that of states is becoming more and more complex. So real power and accountability are elusive. They run across nations, they're regional, they're global. So who do you tell to respect what? How can we leverage laws and policies in such an environment? Where are the clear mechanisms for engagement? And what are the legal and ethical pathways we need to navigate? So this is the second challenge for our generation. We need to make the basics work and figure out how they can be understood by duty bearers and adhere to in a fragmented environment. Third, we have changed as well. Protection actors have changed. Protection actors have always fundamentally been the national and local societies, women-led organizations, youth clubs made first respondents by necessity, faith-based actors, local leaders, community organizers, grassroots organizations, local activists and civil society, yet still much of the decision power, resources and knowledge of the existing laws and policies remains outside this generation of protection actors. Despite commitment after commitment, it is still those who know the most about their society's needs, the appropriate interventions and the routes to influence who are absent from the table. So here's the third challenge for our generation, enable the paradigm shift in international protection work and hand over the tools, resources, know-how and decision for working on laws and policies to the frontline protection force. So what does all of that mean for our session today? I am convinced of the enormous value, practicality, and concrete impact of laws and policies. We see that every day in our operations. However, we can never take this relevance and value for granted. To remain relevant and useful, laws and policies need to be constantly stated, translated, interpreted, debated, discussed, criticized, reviewed. Are they being implemented? Why? Why not? Do this gap analysis, follow through with the participation of actors on the ground. Relevance is not a gift. Relevance comes with daily engagement for laws and policies that provide protection. Relevance comes today from positioning law and policy as a key enabler for the humanitarian human rights, peace and development nexus. A key enabler. Have we succeeded in that positioning? Field protection clusters have an important role to play. First, keeping it up and reminding everyone of their responsibilities in front of the laws and policies. Second, understanding the existing laws and policies and using them for protection outcomes. Third, triggering reforms, triggering conversations and creation of new laws and policies to deliver protection outcomes. And finally, monitoring the reality of implementation and supporting institutions. I can see a day where mapping laws and policies against standards is systematic in all operations where analysis with local and regional universities and think tanks is the norm, where advocacy is initiated to have the right laws and policies in place, where their implementation and utilization is mastered 
by local protection actors and those impacted by the crisis themselves. I'm looking forward, so today's discussion helps me and us understand better this vision and how to get to it. So thank you all and have a great session. Over back to you. Thank you very much, William, for these inspiring words. And now I think uh, we can have uh, Cecilia, uh, thank you so much, Cecilia, for being there, uh, to present the role of the task team so that we can maybe see a little bit how, starting from us, how we can help uh, William's dream uh, to become true. And up to you, Cecilia. Thank you, Martina, and uh, thank you all for joining today. A warm welcome also from NRC. Now the challenge is mine to speak between uh, the dreamer, William, and Dr. Bejani, so I'll do my best. My task is very simple. I just have to present you what uh, the task team uh, is, uh, is and what uh, we are working on. So the task team was established in 2015 as a global platform for, co for coordination between uh, uh, UN agencies and NGOs, but also other relevant uh, stakeholders uh, on law and policy engagement. So it's an important platform where we can exchange to promote regular dialogue, experience sharing, and most importantly, taking action, because we don't want only to have nice speeches like the one we are having today, but also take action and implement what we say. The mission of the task team is twofold. We want, uh, uh, first and foremost, to support governments and local authorities in discharging their responsibilities regarding uh, uh, IDPs and populations affected by displacement. And we do so by promoting and supporting states' efforts in developing and implementing domestic legal and policy framework. Second, we support, the, we support field clusters and relevant partners in contributing to the development, implementation, and monitoring of relevant legal and policy frameworks. So we do this in two uh, different uh, uh, stream of work. And uh, what we do concretely is uh, uh, highlighted through five key areas of uh, work. So we do uh, capacity building. And uh, an example is the training of trainers on uh, law and policy that is currently under uh, redesign and will be ready in November. Uh, we have online, uh, con it will be also uh, available online uh, due to I mean, the new way of working that we are all adopting. Uh, we will continue also having in-person uh, workshops. We do so, so through knowledge sharing. Uh, an example is the regional exchanges that uh, are happening amongst member states and their partners on law and policy, like the one uh, with ECOWAS in West Africa in 2019. We do also uh, promote knowledge uh, sharing through the global database on IDP laws and policies that is currently available on the GPC uh, website. Uh, we do so through guidance and technical advice, the review of the draft uh, IDP law and policies, uh, uh, advice on specific uh, thematic issues and aspects related to uh, law and policy making processes are good examples, but also the guidance and checklist for field clusters that is currently uh, under uh, development is uh, another one. We do so through legal audits, uh, so the country level reviews of legal and policy frameworks related to uh, IDP protection to analyze gaps and uh, inconsistencies with uh, the uh, international law. We do so through specific studies and research. And another example of this is the uh, UNHCR IOM comparative study on IDP law and policy in situation of conflict and disaster and climate change. So this is what we do and, uh, and who we are. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank UNHCR and in particular Martina for the really uh, extraordinary work that uh, she has been doing to prepare for this session. And uh, I welcome any question or uh, comments uh, uh, in the session on uh, uh, Q&A that will follow the presentation. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. And now we can move uh, to the next slide.
Uh, and we welcome uh, Dr. Chaloka Beyani, who needs no introduction, but um, in, in any case, he's a former special rapporteur on the human rights of IDPs, uh, currently a member of the expert advisory group uh, to the UN Secretary General's high level panel on internal displacement, as well as a member of the UN high level fact finding mission to Libya. And uh, Dr. Beyani is also one of the main uh, drafter of the Kampala, the main drafter of the Kampala Convention. He's our, as I I said our champion on, on the issue. And so we would love to hear from you, uh, Chaloka, if it is possible, particularly in relation to two questions, you know, the first one being why should field protection cluster colleagues engage with law and policy making processes, you know, in your experience, uh, you know, what are the benefits for them? Why is it important? And secondly, what are some of the key considerations that colleagues should keep in mind, you know, from your, again, your perspective, whenever they embark in supporting similar processes. So now, after to you for the next five minutes. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Martina. Uh, thank you very much, um, William. And thank you very much, Cecilia, as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to have to meet virtually as times uh, are now. In the past, we might have met uh, face to face. And it was one of the things that I always looked forward to a special rapporteur that is um, meeting with uh, the global protection cluster, the protection clusters. And obviously now it's uh, quite a long time I go from 2016 to uh, 2020. That's, that's about four years. And I see that lots of things have happened, um, which is uh, reassuring. But I'd also uh, reassure William that as Martina introduced me, you heard there was no academic there. So <laughs> I'm just here to speak as a, as a practitioner in the field, um, very much on the same ground that you're, you're covering. No high sounding uh, academic or intellectual phrases at all. It's uh, law and making, law and policy making uh, at the grassroots and from the point of view of practice and the issues that uh, Martina um, put out. So for a start, why should protection clusters uh, engage with law and policy making? Um, and why is this important? Uh, what are the benefits? In the experience that I had as a mandate holder and beyond, um, I saw that law and policy making offers protection clusters avenues to engage with IDPs and also to appreciate the range of protection issues involved. They provide opportunities, for example, for the protection clusters to advance some of the issues of concern that they're dealing with. Uh, this was the case in South Sudan during the time when we were involved in making uh, the law in South Sudan uh, about 2018 to 2019. Um, the protection clusters had very special concerns about uh, housing, land and property rights and how to have those included and reflected in the law. Uh, because this was a special problem. And I think that towards the end, as the draft had been prepared, there was a special session with the protection cluster uh, to go through uh, the draft and the way in which uh, the draft had addressed these issues and for them um, at least to use that uh, partly as a tool of advocacy, but also as a protection uh, tool. But I also noticed that protection clusters are very good at advocacy, promotion, and monitoring protection, but mostly for refugees and less for IDPs. Uh, the engagement with IDPs is of mixed quality and varies from cluster to cluster. And I think this is an area that I would like to encourage um, the protection clusters to be more involved in. And of course, law and making uh, processes uh, provide uh, avenues and opportunities, you know, for doing so. And I think the main challenge here uh, is that law and policy making offers protection clusters opportunities to enhance these qualities, i.e. advocacy, promotion, monitoring, uh, protection in the context of IDPs, but also to link protection with operations and solutions for IDPs, uh, which is the new integrated approach and this integrated approach is being applied uh, very widely and at least in uh, some of the select countries that I'm aware of. Um, it's aided by some of 
experiences in the mandate has been doing um, with um, the enhanced resident coordinators. The enhanced resident coordinators have begun to establish uh, platforms for durable solutions, uh, as was mentioned. Um, and Ward and I work very closely in Ethiopia during the lawmaking process there because he had worked with the resident coordinators uh, office to uh, at least establish a framework for durable solutions, which was integrated in the law and policy. He had done similar work in Somalia, uh, and currently I'm drafting a law uh, for Somalia uh, and integrating some of the earlier work that was done on durable solutions. Uh, and what is also working in the Ukraine, although I haven't been to the Ukraine uh, ever since my last visit there uh, in 2016. Although the process is expert-led, and it's expert-led in order to try and make sure that it's seen as neutral, it's not tribal, uh, some of the local actors are painted with uh, IDP colors one or another, uh, and engaging national and international experts is one way of avoiding uh, attributions that may otherwise uh, jeopardize uh, the process. However, within that, it must be ensured that national ownership and legitimacy is anchored in a law and making um, and policy making process. Uh, we're making a law for the government, not for ourselves, not for the international actors or other bodies. And so great care should be taken to ensure that the government is involved at almost every stage and that government sensitivities uh, in terms of um, their own product uh, is important. Most governments would not be happy that you have a draft, you have an outline, and within 24 hours, it's doing the rounds on the internet somewhere. Um, they tend to safeguard law and making uh, processes um, very much. These processes uh, establish a collaborative relationship with government, other stakeholders, uh, and a whole range. You know, in South Sudan, of course, the focal point was the Minister for Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, but you also had uh, the Commission um, for Disaster Preparedness. You had the principal secretaries across all over government. And you had a range of MPs, uh, at least 60 to 65 MPs, because they belong to the two um, committees of Parliament on Human Rights and on Law and Justice that had been at least the basis for making recommendations that the law and policy on IDPs um, uh, should be adopted. And the Speaker of the Parliament, no less, uh, was involved. So one has to map out who are the main influential stakeholders uh, within government, uh, who are the main partners that government should be working with. So the expert-led process means that the expert has to map out all these processes and engage and identify with these actors, more because the local actors usually have dynamics with governments one or another. Uh, you know, in one country that I, I shan't mention, it, it happened that a new director in a ministry had served um, somewhere in Geneva and relations were awkward with uh, in Geneva <laughs> um, with uh, someone who became rep in the country in which they were. Um, but as an expert, at least you can try and navigate around those issues, smooth them all over uh, the place and, and bring the process to bear uh, to fruition. I think part of the benefit is also that lawmaking processes create a space for dialogue, open opportunities with relevant national and local stakeholders, as well as a variety of um, international stakeholders, including donors and development partners. So the South Sudan process was fairly thorough in looking at um, who are the UN partners, uh, for example, UNDP, because of their interest in promoting law and policy, uh, the UN mission and its rule of law program. Um, and it had mapped out the national laws of South Sudan um, as a legal system. And quite critically, they also engaged with parliament uh, during uh, presentations of bills in parliament uh, proposed as law and prepared speaking notes uh, for uh, members of parliament. So they're very crucial in filling that legislative gap and making sure that when the bill would get to parliament, you have dedicated uh, MPs uh, fully informed 
and a partner who engages uh, with them. We also had um, international donors, uh, USAID, um, the EU, uh, and others all speaking in support uh, of, of all of this. So it does help very much. I think in Somalia, we have gone a little bit further uh, in identifying uh, the key donors and engaging with them uh, because we discovered that at least uh, three quarters of the budget in Somalia uh, is funded by international partners and donors. So it made sense to bring the donors on board uh, to make sure that the donors uh, sent the right kind of messages to government and vice versa and to create special structures that both the government and the donors were aware. For example, the creation of an IDP fund, um, which emanates from the Kampala Convention, requiring states parties who have ratified it uh, to create a fund specifically for IDPs. Because of the experience that almost everywhere, IDPs are marginalized in the ministries, function, um, functionaries that deal with IDPs are also equally marginalized in terms of resources uh, in government. And, and that was one way of making sure that uh, that particular state of affairs uh, is addressed. And even before, well, well after the Kampala Convention, I did find um, out in Azerbaijan that they have a special fund for IDPs, uh, which is based on some of the uh, uh, oil revenue earnings that the government makes, and a certain percentage of that goes into fund for IDPs. So innovation uh, in terms of uh, not just the law, but how do you look forward to implement it and also make sure that uh, it does work. Other benefits include uh, galvanizing momentum on addressing internal displacement from the onset of a lawmaking process. Uh, a variety of international stakeholders, including donors, development partners, uh, as has been uh, the case. Um, and I think here, the situation of IDPs is discussed. It's an educational process, and not all the stakeholders understand what an IDP is. And so you start from A to Z, the guiding principles, the Kampala Convention, if applicable, uh, IDPs. And of course, you will find some from especially the development world who will say, well, but why are we privileging IDPs and not look at the vulnerability needs of everyone else uh, in this context? So. All of those issues are dealt with uh, at the first level uh, of the actual the situational analysis of what the state of affairs is uh, and building on that within the workshop, um, how that would be uh, dealt with. Um, this was the case in South Sudan um, and in Ethiopia as well. And in South Sudan, it was actually quite remarkable because when I had the mission there, I think it was in 20, 2013, just before the conflict broke out, and we went to um, Jongle, uh, Pibo, and places like that. Uh, and then the government had um, uh, assigned a governor, who, he was a governor of Jongle at that particular time, uh, to go with me. And when we got to the sites, he said, oh my God, I had never seen an IDP before uh, in my life, and I had never seen the circumstances in which IDPs live. By the time we were holding the workshop, that former governor had become the Minister for Humanitarian Affairs and the focal point for IDP. So he needed no persuasion at all. And in fact, he was key to persuading uh, others. Um, you recall in Afghanistan, the workshop started even with uh, the importance of profiling. Martina was there, <laughs> led that session. Um, and so it's a process in which you put all the benchmarks that are important to protect IDPs that they understood uh, as the process goes on, uh, right up to uh, uh, completion. You can contrast with Ukraine, for example, at the outset of displacement, it was, it was mainly the provincial authorities that were attending to IDPs together with uh, NGOs uh, and churches. Um, the national government was more uh, in a state of shock. Um, but one of the issues that prompted the importance of a law uh, in the Ukraine was that these local authorities would only give budgetary support to IDPs for no more than three to six months. That was the emergency power. If they did that beyond that period of time, the measures would become unlawful. 
and they may be arrested for <laughs> unlawful use of government resources. So a law on IDPs was therefore required to alter those powers um, in order to make them be able to provide continuous uh, assistance to IDPs. So there may be other laws that are a hindrance uh, and the lawmaking process is then an opportunity to try and align um, you know, all of those laws. And this is now being done in the context of um, a whole of government approach, what we have called coordination before, uh, building on the New York Declaration, the global compacts, and of course, a whole of society approach in the context of durable solutions. And both of these have been applied in the Ethiopian and Somali context and are now being applied um, as well um, you know, elsewhere. Coming to the second question, so I can end. I think Martina is getting a little. I will give you an extra minute. I could listen on and on, but I'm afraid we're going to struggle otherwise. Fine. Thank you so much. I'll just make the bullet points uh, with regard to your second question. What are, what are the key considerations? Well, stakeholder map mapping, I think, is important. You need uh, dedicated champions, experts, and others to see. Uh, the law throughout. You have to identify the spoilers because there are people who are anti-IDPs. Uh, there were people in government in the Ukraine who say they should stay in the East and not come to where uh, we are in, in the Ukraine. In the Philippines, you had government advisors who said, well, this law came from the National Commission on Human Rights. It didn't come from us government and um, therefore persuaded the president not to sign it. You know, the importance of making sure that the lawmaking processes are, are, are carried forward. Uh, so build um, allies uh, in this whole process and have a low jam breaking mechanism when you hit the buffers. Identify where the, the roadblocks are and speak to the people involved directly. Most of them hide behind institutions, have a sense of self-importance. But once you identify them, uh, things change. How to involve displacement affected communities. Um, in South Sudan, we used a questionnaire first devised by the Global Learning Center, which was very helpful as a method of engaging with IDPs and asking them questions. So look at what's available and what you can uh, make uh, use of. Uh, technical support, resident coordinators, as I've mentioned, UN missions, you know, the uh, representative of the Secretary General in uh, Somalia said, well, if you have no access to the speaker whom we try, try to, to reach, uh, he said, I, I can reach the speaker uh, and we know why he's unreachable at the moment. So identify people who can open doors uh, to get to uh, specific places. Finally, possible challenges, um, you know, political dynamics around violence and conflict induced internal displacement. The forces of displacement are always active and they follow IDPs, and they follow the measures that are being proposed to deal with IDPs, uh, such as law and policy, uh, and they will be there uh, as, as maybe troublemakers or people wanting to derail the process. Um, and involvement throughout the duration of the process is key. Don't hand over a draft uh, to the minister and think that that's the end of the day, because government dynamics are such that some of the issues are, are likely to, to resurface. Uh, in South Sudan, when the law was drafted, uh, the revitalized government had not yet been put together. Now it has been put together and the new members of the government, of course, are raising issues that had already been dealt with. Uh, and also because of the politicization of IDPs in the POC centers, um, you know, the law has hit some buffers. So just to make sure that the protection cluster qualities of monitoring advocacy are fully deployed, and follow the process uh, through and through. Thank you, Martina. I hope I haven't. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was fantastic. Thanks so much, Chaloka, for sharing all these great insights. And I really look forward to hearing now from our colleagues how they translated some of this uh, uh, consideration in the work uh, at the national level. And therefore, uh, I'm, it's a pleasure really to present uh, our colleagues that will be in the panel today. Valerie uh, Svobodova, uh, she's the head of uh, the Human Rights Liaison Unit uh, here at UNHCR. I know many of you also know her 
for her role as co-chair of the GPC task team on human rights engagement. And she's the former um, Niger Protection Cluster Coordinator. So that it's to that experience that she will speak to us today. Uh, after Valerie, we will have Lorena Nieto. Uh, she's a senior protection officer in the Americas Regional Bureau in Panama at the moment, leading the regional protection sector of the platform for the response to refugees and migrants from Venezuela. But she's the former Honduras Protection Working Group Coordinator. And again, it is to that experience that she will uh, speak today about the work that's been done in that country. And finally, we will hear from Elina Shishkina, and she's um, uh, the advocacy coordinator for the charitable fund the Right to Protection in Ukraine, uh, a very active protection cluster member. And we look forward to hear from Elina as well. But we are going to start from Valerie um, at the moment. Uh, next. And thanks, Valerie. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are listening from. And as Martina said today, I would like to share with you an example from Niger, where I was the protection cluster coordinator before coming to Geneva, along with inputs from uh, the colleagues uh, um, in the protection cluster in Niger who are also online. So next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a very brief overview on the situation in Niger, uh, currently there are about 220,000 IDPs. In the time when we were working on the uh, IDP law, they were mainly concentrated in the east of the country, uh, in DIFA region, uh, displacement because of Boko Haram related activities, and in the west, uh, in Tel Aviv region, uh, where uh, several non-state armed groups are active. We need to understand that the population is very mixed in Niger context, so there are IDPs living in the same areas as refugees, returnees, as well as host population. And in many instances, actually, host population may be even in more vulnerable situations than the displaced population. Uh, the IDPs are also very mobile, uh, not only that they are moving because of the livelihoods, seeking livelihoods opportunities, but also they suffered uh, from secondary tertiary movement. So, uh, in addition to that, um, being in areas that are difficult to access for humanitarians out of camp simulation, so uh, spontaneous sites uh, and not uh, uh, easily reached by humanitarians, this gives us a picture of quite complex situation. So, next slide, please. I would like to share with you how did the process on IDP law actually start in Niger. Uh, Niger ratified the Kampala Convention already in 2012 and committed to domesticated. However, not much has been happening uh, until 2017 on this front. There we benefited from the um, actually training of trainers by the Global Protection Cluster Task Team on Law and Policy, which was organized regionally in Dakar, Senegal in April back in 2017. This was an important moment because we went a delegation from Niger uh, composed of the government representatives as well as protection cluster and UNHCR as an agency. And this really allowed us to set the dynamics, set the tone, have a common understanding and come out of this training with a very simple but uh, concrete action plan how we will proceed. So when back to Niger, we started with training sessions, and this was very small scale at the beginning uh, in DIFA region through the Protection Working Group on guiding principles, Kampala conventions, and the topics that uh, Chaloka Beani just mentioned uh, in his opening remarks before. But what was a key moment um, in December 2017, the government with UNHCR and Protection Cluster co-organized a workshop on IDP law and policy. And this was really the key moment because uh, as a result of this workshop, there was an interministerial committee for the elaboration of the draft law that was established. Uh, this was early 2018, composed and uh, well, at the lead uh, by the Ministry of Humanitarian Action, but also composed of Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Defense, Interior, Population, Promotion of Women and Protection of Children, members of Parliament, and as observers, Protection Cluster UNHCR or China ICRC. So this was a key moment. Next slide, please. 
how did it continue and what actually contributed uh, to this process? I must admit that we benefited a lot uh, by official visit of the Special Rapporteur on IDPs, Cecilia Jimenez Damari, who came to Niger in April 2018. It was a fantastic uh, opportunity for us because we had several series of um, meetings with the government, with local authorities at national level. We could speak to IDPs in various regions, get the different stakeholders together around a table. And as a result of her visit, we have drafted an action plan how to proceed next. And one of the key recommendations was to advance law on IDPs in Niger. So this gave us an opening how to take it forward. We have then continued quite intensively with training sessions. So they were training sessions to the interministerial committee, because as you can imagine, not all representatives were very familiar even with the distinction between IDP, refugee, migrant, why we need to protect IDPs, what are the key principles, what are their vulnerabilities, but also other protection related topics. So we had a series of training, for the committee also externally and bring all the stakeholders on board, including the humanitarian country team, representatives of the defense and security forces and so on. At the same time, and this was very useful, UNHCR hired a consultant which was really dedicated to supporting the process and review the existing legislation, carry out consultations with various stakeholders on the draft law, and was there to accompany uh, the Ministry of Humanitarian Action. In parallel, there were uh, several consultations with IDPs that were carried out. This included uh, not only um, you know, sensitization, but also asking them what are the key problems that you would like to see addressed? Uh, um, what are the key gaps that you see? So really trying to see their inputs to how uh, this could be translated into the IDP law. We try to also work on sensitizations with the local community. So it was done through radio messages, through uh, protection cluster members. We have translated the uh, IDP guiding principles into local languages to be more accessible to different communities in Niger. And I would like to add also one another element which was important for us. If you remember in 2018, the GP20 action plan of action came at global level. And what was a useful element for us in Niger that we have contextualized the global plan of action with the four pillars uh, that you are familiar with and looked at what we can do at local level. And as the second pillar is related to uh, legal frameworks, this gave us another entry point, another hook to actually translate it and follow up with different stakeholders, including government, of course, on, um, on the IDP law. Next slide, please. So, uh, late 2018, December, the law was passed. Uh, as you probably know, Niger was the first country in Africa to adopt a, a law on um, internal displacement. So, a fantastic achievement. Now, the question was, what's next? And uh, it was important to still, uh, as Chaluka Bayoni mentioned before, not to uh, stop the support or the efforts, but on the contrary, accompany uh, the Ministry of Humanitarian Action that is at the lead of dissemination of this law, but also sensitizing and building the capacity of various actors on this new law. In our colleagues in Niger that are currently there also share two very concrete examples on how the law has been already useful in concrete situations in Niger. One of them being when there was last year a new displacement of uh, uh, internal displacement in Maradi area. Initially, the local authority, authorities were reluctant to admit that there is, first of all, uh, an internal displacement, but also that uh, um, population would have some specific needs and they are in need of protection. So after sensitizations, after discussion and mainly discussing the new law, um, they changed the, the position and provided actually protective space to the newly displaced population. Uh, second example, also very interesting, is uh, when providing uh, trainings to defense and security forces, it proved to be very useful to have concrete examples uh, taken from the law and uh, share the existing legal frameworks in case studies during the workshop or trainings. And it was really appreciated as a concrete framework by the defense and security forces. 
So last slide, please. If I should summarize, what are the key takeaways from our experience in Niger? Uh, from uh, our experience, we would say don't be at the front. So uh, IDP law is, of course, first and foremost, the responsibility of the government. It's a process driven by national authorities. And what I think led to a success in Niger, in Niger was that we had always the government at the forefront. So there were several initiatives behind a consultant supporting on drafting of the process, uh, protection cluster members supporting on capacity building, sensitization, and so on. But the government was leading it. And this is important for the sustainability, for the implementation, for the ownership, and how it is taken forward. Um, what was also key for us that we did not jump, I think, in Niger immediately to drafting of the law of the document and following a template which is available, but rather creating an environment that was conducive. So we invested a lot into capacity building. Uh, in total, there were over 20 trainings to different stakeholders, uh, consultations with IDPs and host community. And I would also like to stress the importance of having the national human rights institutions on board. They can be a very key player in those situations and having them on board and following up the process from their respective mandate. I mentioned previously that we use the GP20 action plan as an entry point and actually bringing together the stakeholders and being able to follow up. And the same goes with the support of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on IDP. So this really created the momentum, the space uh, to discuss with the government and uh, take it forward with stakeholders to, to have the support. And my final point is on the fact that definitely every actor has a role to play in this process, be it a national NGO, international NGO, national human rights institution, protection cluster coordinators, agencies as such, uh, different ministries, uh, but there need to be a coordination and a willingness to advance together. So this is a, a short uh, overview of how the process went in Niger, and I would like to pass the word back to Martina. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Valerie, for this very comprehensive uh, presentation of the great work that was done uh, in, in Niger. Thanks for highlighting the importance, as you said, of capacity building, of the engagement of human rights mechanisms, both at the national level and the international level with the, the, the strategic use of the special procedures. And for the practical uh, examples that you have shown of how the law was used as well, as we already heard, and as we know, the work doesn't end uh, once the law is adopted. So that's fantastic. And I would like now to leave the floor to Lorena uh, and welcome again. Thank Thanks. you, Martina. And good morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, um, this was supposed to be a decalogue, but due to time constraints, we will make it a pentalogue. And I hope this might be uh, useful for your work um, on IDPs. Uh, next, please. So, when we got to Honduras, basically, what did we have? We had a recognition of the situation of the problem by the government uh, with a decree in which they stated that uh, the situation was real, they acknowledged the situation, and then they um, were creating an interinstitutional commission that was joined by, by some of the members of the protection working group and included all key entities within the government. They had already agreed on the need to have a law, which was, of course, um, an added value, and then finally, um, we already had a profiling on IDPs um, that didn't really had national coverage, but provided an initial figure which with, uh, we could work. So this was uh, 2016 when we started the process. What did we miss? Uh, situation of violence in Honduras has been, of course, acknowledged, uh, known to everyone. Um, we didn't have the time to meet protection needs. What I mean by, by that, the decision of having a law was there, that was positive, but of course the drafting of a law, the, appra the approval of a law, and then the implementation of a law takes a lot of time. And we couldn't just answer to the communities, you have to wait because we are just doing, working on the law. We needed to resolve some of the protection needs and gaps that we were identifying. Then we, we, did it, we knew we didn't have political will, and this is something that one of the uh, participants has shared as a question in terms of parliaments. 
we knew that the parliament had a different agenda. They were agreeing on doing the law, but the situation in the country had a lot of different elements in which IDPs were not the priority. Resources, you know, that Honduras is a country that uh, is really depending on uh, the money that families are sending from the U.S. It doesn't really have a strong economy. So the resources in terms of budgeting, financial, technical were um, scarce. And um, there was an issue in terms of trust between communities uh, and the government. And this was the basic situation in which we needed to work on. Next, please. So uh, what did we do? And this is the uh, pentalogue that I was uh, mentioning. The first thing is that we knew we needed to make a reality check. So when do we, where do you start when you do that? You need to take a look on budgets. And this is the initial point. You can have a law that is great, that is well written, but if the government doesn't really have the resources for the implementation phase, then you might be approving a law that will never be implemented. So what we did, and this is one of the key steps uh, in the process, is that you need to go through the budget of the nation. You need to see the efforts that the government is making, um, how much money do they have, and when we did that, we understood that uh, many of the entities that were key in the national uh, treasure didn't really have any money. Or some of the members of the protection working group had more money than the entities in the government. So we understood the dimension of the situation on the economical aspects and how we needed to make a prioritization. And this was key in the process. And that's one of the reasons why we decided that, yes, we are going to support the process of the design of the law. But uh, in order to be able to address some of these protection needs, we are going to focus on one of the key protection gaps that we are identifying. And that was uh, land and house grabbing. Why was this so essential? Because um, the magnitude of the violence was so high and the numbers of IDPs were so low that we didn't understand how communities were coping with these levels of violence. When we did the process of mapping and making, a, we did a, an exercise with the Catholic Church throughout the country to understand which parishes had uh, known or received IDPs, we understood that people were moving, but we, they were afraid of losing their property. So they were just coping, coping, coping levels of violence uh, just to protect their houses and their land. So we understood that if we were able to protect these uh, properties, people would be in the, in the possibility of just displacing with like uh, somehow the uh, tranquility of understanding that at least their property, their house, their land will be registered and protected. And this is what we prioritized within the process. And I will go uh, into in depth into that. Uh, then there is something that is really important and is that response can not start from scratch. I mean, you cannot tell a government you have this problem of forced displacement and then you need to start designing everything, everything from zero. Governments do not have the capacity, the political will, the technical capacity, the budgeting to do that. So um, what we did is that we told them, okay, so let's go through the legal framework that you already have. There are many things there that will work to address the situation and force displacement. You don't have to design everything from zero. And we focused on the property law that did already provide this entity the capacity to register all these abandoned land and housing. So we understood that, yes, we can move forward with the design of the law, but we have already a legal tool that will help us to address this gap that we are identifying. And somehow this was like a scenario in which we could tell communities, yes, we are working on the law, but you can right now start the process of registering and protecting your uh, property, and this is what we did. Then, um, and this is where I believe that the protection working groups, protection clusters have a huge added value, is that within that lack of institutional trust, what the protection working group brought to the table was their relationship with communities, legitimacy, credibility. We knew where communities stand, we knew how to address them, and within a situation of social and territorial control by gangs, 
uh, we had um, humanitarian space. So what we did is that we started to bring the government to situations of mass displacement so they could understand how that worked. They could talk to, uh, talk to communities directly. We also made the process of um, making participatory situations or sessions so communities could mention what they wanted within the law, what they needed at, and what their priorities were. In the process of the protection of abandoned property, we also worked with the Catholic Church to identify abandoned property with the information that communities were providing. And then we brought the government, the property institute, so they could, with communities, map and identify each of the houses that communities were mentioning had been abandoned due to forced displacement. So this process of building bridges is really key. This is something that the government doesn't know how to do. And even if they knew how to do it, they do not have the relationship with the communities that will help communities to be open and to share the situation and their concerns. Um, so this is something in which we identified that the government um, uh, knew that the protection working group was bringing an added value. They needed that in order to bring the law into the uh, design and implementation. And this is what we did. Next, um, there are some simultaneous processes that um, we need to address. And this is what I was mentioning at the beginning in terms of we have the situation and then we have the time that all legal developments will take. And if we are talking about public policies, it might be longer. It's the same situation um, that we were addressing. And we decided to move forward with, with both things. So we did the process of the designing of the law. We included there some articles to guarantee protection of abandoned property. But at the same time, we were providing technical uh, advice to the Property Institute to develop a module of uh, abandoned houses due to forced displacement within the National Registration Service. So we were doing both things at the, at the same time. Where did we have the gap? The uh, property law provided the Property Institute the faculty to register these properties. What the Institute couldn't do was deciding which protection measures could be taken or who was responsible for that process. So basically, um, there, that, that's where we knew that this property law that we already had and the work that we were doing with the Property Institute was finalizing or needed the law in order to be complete. So we were doing both things at the same time. And this is something that could provide um, some relief to IDPs and at the same time will bring the mid and longer term solution. And finally, um, you must need data. And all the all existing data works. It's really hard, and this is again going back to the parliament question that you know, one of the participants shared. Um, if you don't have data, it's really difficult to get into the discussion with the government, with the parliaments, or with any key actors, even donors. So uh, we need data to understand the magnitude. We need data to understand how to prioritize the response we need data to, in order to be able to share with the government how to start the process. It's very difficult when we tell the government this is the standard and you need to address all of that. It's not real. So we need to be able to have the information and the data to share with government and say, okay, so this is the situation, this is the magnitude. We understand that in terms of budgeting resources, blah, blah, blah you need to prioritize. And these are some of the key elements that you can take to decide how to prioritize your response. In the case of Honduras, we had, we had the protection of abandoned uh, property, which was really positive. And we were also able to prioritize humanitarian assistance for displaced persons. So um, this is some of the key aspects in which you need to work on. Next, please. Um, so, at the, at the analysis of the overall situation, where did we find this added value? The first was, uh, as I was mentioning before, we have the knowledge. Many of the actors of the protection working groups had worked in Honduras for 40, 50 years. They knew very well the situation, the, the, how the situation had changed, the trends, the profiles, and this is something that the government needs in order to be able to design 
um, a law or any sort of response. We had the legitimacy for the same reason that I was just mentioning. We had the platforms to make advocacy. I believe, and this is something that I'm going to mention uh, when I address the challenges, um, we are very strong in, in advocacy at the global, international levels. We have some gaps in, in other areas, but I will address that. And then finally, we also have the methodologies, and this is very important. Usually the government doesn't really know how to address communities, participatory assessments, participatory sessions, and if this is linked to the development of laws, this becomes much more complicated for governments. So this is something in which the protection working group was sharing methodologies that we had used for several years that worked in order to be able to establish a communication with communities to understand what they needed, what their priorities were, their concerns, and how they wanted to make this relationship with the institutions and also the international community. Where do we have challenges? I believe that uh, we lack technical capacity in terms of how to provide technical assistance for the development of law and public policies. I'm not saying, and this is, I believe, very key, we do not need to be lawyers. This is not what you need in order to be able to support a government in the design of a law. But we, we do have um, to improve our skills, for example, in understanding and reading budgets. And this is something that usually for protection actors is very uh, weird. This is some work, some skills that someone else within our teams usually has, but we, we don't. And we need to have that because all of the law efforts that we have on the table will have to have money. And in order to be able to do that, to develop a law that will be... Um, that, that can be implemented, we need to be able to have the resources to do that within the reality of the country in which we are working. So technical capacity to understand budgets and how national budgets work, I believe is key and one of the gaps in which we need to work. Institutional approach, and this is something that I believe is key. I was mentioning before that we cannot address governments from the standards point of view. We need to uh, be able to address a, a relationship in which we understand the reality that they are facing. We acknowledge the efforts, even if, if there are many few, but we acknowledge the efforts that they are making. And within that, we are able to build a constructive, collaborative relationship instead of someone who is pointing that you are not doing what you are supposed to do at the, or that you address these specific international instruments if we are not able to um, level that relationship within reality, it will not work. Um, we also need to be able to provide ad, um, assistance for the short, medium, and long terms. And sometimes this is a huge gap that we as protection actors have. We commit to the emergency phase, we commit to the initial needs of populations, and then we just leave the government to do what they have to do. And there is a problem with that. We need to understand that the process that we do from the onset of the emergency or the situation will have to have a continuation. It needs to be sustainable. That means that we need to have the capacities, the technical capacities, the budget um, strength to support the process. In Honduras, the recognition of the of forced displacement was done in 2000, 2013. The law that is very well written, that includes 88 articles, was uh, finalized in 2016, and it has not yet been officially submitted to the Congress. So it can fail. We can fail in what we do. Um, the situation there is linked to how, what, how can we engage a government from the different secretaries or ministries that doesn't have the money, doesn't have the political will, and I believe that in terms of building medium long term interventions, we need to be able to um, strengthen our skills and our capacities to address um, new actors, for example, as the colleague was mentioning, uh, the parliament. How can we, and then I connect to the, to the final challenge, advocacy. We are good in advocacy in these kind of scenarios, talking with people that already believe in what we do 
um, that share our uh, concerns. But when we have to move into other scenarios, not as known as these ones, and we need to convince politicals, uh, politics, I'm sorry, um, of the importance of forced displacement, we are not as strong as we should be. Um, I believe we need to have some training on that. I believe that uh, even if you follow all of the steps, we can fail. I mean, uh, we had the law. It has not been submitted to the Congress. There is no law in forced displacement in Honduras so far. We, had, we have been able to provide registration to several um, IDPs for their land and housing, and that is very positive. However, the situation, the political environment in the country, the political will, the political interests have not make it possible to move towards the, the operation and then the implementation of the law. So these are some of the areas in which I believe we need to have um, a strengthened support capacity and training in order to be able to meet the added value with the challenges that we have already identified. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lorena, for, for an excellent uh, presentation. Really helpful to, to, to hear about you know, your recommendation around the, the, the bridging role that the protection cluster can play, you know, bringing together the government and the communities, the importance of consultations with communities that has already come up in Valerie's presentation with regards to Niger, as well as in Dr. Chaloka Beyani's presentation with regards to South Sudan. And for reminding us that there's a lot that we can do to you and use law and policy in different ways even when an idp law is not yet in place there's still much that we can do to advance protection for the populations of concerns that we are ultimately uh, trying to to, to to serve so um i will leave it at that for the moment thanks again and i would like to introduce again elina uh, who's going to speak to us about a different uh, challenge uh, the, the the work that has been done in uh, Ukraine in the current COVID uh, context. Uh, to you, Lina, and welcome. Thank you, Martina. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who can hear me. I hope you uh, hear me well, and uh, I'd like to tell you I'm happy to be here and to present the experience of Ukraine in the context of uh, restrictions of uh, freedom of movement in the east of Ukraine emerged as a result of COVID-related restrictions. So, and uh, I hope I will able to uh, demonstrate to show you how protection and advocacy measures in the field of IDPs and uh, conflict affected persons rights are connected uh, for in an example in Ukraine. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, a little bit presentation about uh, the organization I'm presenting here right now, Right to Protection. Uh, right to Protection is one of the leaders uh, of NGOs in Ukraine in the field of migration for almost 20 years. Our beneficiaries are uh, refugees and asylum seekers, statelessness, uh, stateless persons or persons at risk of statelessness, and IDPs and conflict affected persons. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, and as you can see, advocacy protection and legal aid for IDPs and conflict affected persons uh, is the biggest program uh, launched in uh, 2016. We have eight offices in five regions, mostly in the eastern of Ukraine. And the next slide, please. Thank you. And a little bit about armed conflict in Ukraine. Uh, you can see that territories highlighted by green and blue and pink are temporarily occupied territories. Green is a territory of Crimean Peninsula uh, occupied since 2014 and uh, affected uh, regions of Ukraine in eastern Ukraine uh, affected by war by armed conflict are Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast. Uh, Donetsk is the blue one, Luhansk is the pink one. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the uh, the conflict is ongoing, and the hostilities are in the uh, eastern of Ukraine uh, are ongoing. So you can see that uh, um, it's a little map more closely. That uh, gray zone, it's not the gray zone. It's actually a non-government control area, and uh, the line is that device uh, GCA and NGCA is the line of contact. And there are five entry exit checkpoints in Ukraine through uh, along the line of contact. 
and uh, these ECPs are served for crossing uh, for persons who reside on GCA or on NGCA to go back and forth. So uh, a little bit numbers for for instance uh, last year there are uh, almost there were almost 14 million of crossings through the line of contact and uh, persons who live on NGCA for instance they have to cross the line of contact through ECPs and come to a government controlled area for uh, receiving um, some services like administrative services or receiving uh, pensions or social payments and persons who are IDPs who fled the armed conflict in 2014, 2015 and even now in 2020, uh, they uh, sometimes visit uh, NGCA where they left their houses uh, or even relatives, so they have to uh, cross the line of contact from time to time to uh, go to NGCA. However, uh, due to quarantine measures this year because of COVID pandemic, uh, on March of this year, the government of Ukraine suddenly closed all ECPs and it had uh, a huge negative consequences for persons who planned to cross the line of contact through entry exit checkpoints. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, First of all, uh, the freedom of movement of persons who live uh, either on GCA or on NGCA uh, was restricted because uh, even if they planned to come uh, for NGCA to visit their relatives, for instance, they couldn't do this because all ECPs were suddenly closed by the government. Uh, and uh, it uh, affected some uh, a lot of families because families were separated, for instance, uh, grandparents and grandchildren uh, were left on NGCA and parents who came to GCA for some social payments or administrative services uh, were left to GCA, so it was a huge challenge for them. And individuals stuck uh, on GCA or NGCA without housing costs for a living or medical care. Next slide, please. Uh, they were deprived from possibility to return to their homes and to visit their relatives, particularly elderly people, or to receive some social benefits, pensions or administrative services. Uh, however, the crossing was allowed only for humanitarian uh, reasons, like serious illness, uh, death of relatives, or they need to reunite families. I'd like to say that after Yes, uh, I'd like to say that after um, uh, when uh, the after ECPs were closed, uh, Ukrainian NGOs and international organizations affiliated in Ukraine have united their efforts in order to negotiate with the government uh, to reopen uh, entry exit checkpoints. And uh, however, it was uh, uh, quite hard. It was a complicated process of negotiating because uh, the main uh, point was not in the governmental uh, will, but uh, the main point was to negotiate with uh, Joint Forces Operation Headquarters. So, uh, and uh, two months ECPs were closed totally. Uh, however, uh, for humanitarian needs, there were some like uh, possibilities to cross the line of contact through ECPs and in April, May of this year, only uh, 297 persons uh, were allowed to cross the line of contact through ECPs for humanitarian needs and exclusively for humanitarian needs. I'd like to say that RTP collected all information about persons who stuck on ECPs and who tried to uh, cross the line of contact. And uh, we shared this information with international organizations like OSCE, and uh, uh, RTP assisted uh, many people uh, to uh, reunite with their families and to uh, cross the line of contact uh, back and forth. Next slide, please. Um, uh, however, uh, in June uh, of this year, because of uh, negotiations with the government, with the Ministry of Reintegration uh, of Ukraine, etc., uh, ECPs were reopened, only two of them are fully fully operational, but uh, there was uh, now another problem for persons who cross the line of contact from NGCA to government controlled area. Uh, 
they have to uh, install the mobile application act at home on their smartphones and indicate the location for their self-isolation. Uh, if they do not, uh, they have to undergo the 14-day observation in location provided by local authorities on GCA or return to NGCA. So if they uh, are not uh, able to, uh, to install this mobile application on their smartphones, they are not allowed to cross the line of contact through uh, entry-exit checkpoints. Next slide, please. And uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, big challenge for uh, R2P and other organizations in Ukraine who uh, work in the field of IDPs and conflict affected populations' rights. So uh, we united our efforts again, and uh, particularly R2P collects information about uh, all troubles and all uh, problems, technical problems with evident home and uh observation that uh, persons have to undergo uh for instance and uh we uh like identified some problems some challenges for people who cross the uh, line of contact first of all uh, old smartphones uh do not support the application act at home in this case individuals are not allowed to cross uh, through ecps uh the another problem that observatories where people have to pass observation after crossing uh, are absent or are overcrowded. And uh, the another problem, if the persons are not allowed to cross the ECPs, they have to pass uh, a night, for instance, or even some days in the neutral zone between ECPs on government controlled area and ECPs on non-government controlled area. It's a huge risk for uh, persons to um, and their uh, humanitarian needs because they are left without uh, costs for living there, uh, without housing and medical care and other services they have to be provided. Next slide, please. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, to in order to negotiate with uh, with the government, with ministries. R2P collects all information about uh, technical problems with uh, mobile app installation, about observation and self-isolation of persons who cross uh, the line of contact. And we uh, like transfer this uh, primary information to the governmental bodies in order to they improve the procedure of crossing or uh, if in case of uh, mobile application act at home, we uh, negotiate with the Ministry of Digital Transformation regarding the improving uh, technical improving of the app. So uh, we, based on the, our prim uh, primary information, uh, the Ministry of Digital Information is currently improving the application act at home. And we hope it will be uh, soon uh, the uh, improved uh, totaling. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, other our activities uh, that, as I mentioned, we inform uh, the ministries regarding all problems, uh, not re only related to the mobile application, but related to the uh, observation of uh, persons uh, who have to pass it after they cross ECPs. And we advocate uh, as well that the discriminatory restrictions for those who arrive from non-governmental cultural area must be cancelled. Uh, and uh, we advocate as well the general conditions and general procedure of crossing through entry exit checkpoints should be improved. Uh, I'd like to say that even foreigners who come to Ukraine from green zone countries, they are not uh, required to install the application act at home but they have to have an insurance from COVID-19. However, uh, citizens of Ukraine who reside on NGCA have to install this uh, application and have, and have to pass uh, observation regarding quarantine measures in Ukraine. Um, next slide, please. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, R2P joins its efforts with uh, humanitarian community in Ukraine with, other, with international NGOs um, and protection cluster members in order to uh, unite our efforts uh, to advocate measures that help IDPs and conflict-affected persons to ensure their right of uh, and freedom of movement through the line of contact. 
So uh, after uh, the reopening of ESTPs, we observed uh, the situation. We monitor the situation on the line of, along the line of contact, and we monitor how governmental acts um, uh, are implemented in terms of quarantine measures. And uh, considering information provided IRTP and other NGOs and international organizations, the governmental bodies now improve the procedure of crossing in terms of uh, quarantine. It's a long process and it's a quite hard, uh, complicated process. It's an ongoing process, and uh, but uh, I think that uh, we, we do our, all our best in order to ensure IDP's rights and in order to cancel all the restrictions for freedom of movement of persons uh, that they uh, come uh, can come to a government control area and receive all administrative services, social benefits uh, or other payments uh, and unite with their families and uh, be like a full, uh, be like a, a full, uh, have uh, all their rights regarding their citizenship of Ukraine. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking forward to your questions or uh, remarks. Thank you very much, Elina, for your presentation. I think this is an excellent uh, example of how we can use our protection monitoring and the analysis that comes from the information that we collect to really push for the advocacy for the um, to advocate for the legislative change that we that we want to see uh, it's excellent that you were already able through your advocacy already to lead to the the change in the reopening of the boarding crossing you know through this the decrease of, of the ministry but um, and hopefully you'll be successful in your um, other efforts as well. We have uh, three questions in particular uh, that we would like now the, our colleagues to address in this last few minutes before we pass the uh, floor, to, we leave the floor to Echo for Corita for some concluding remarks. Um, I wanted to mention in particular um, one question around the, the role of the international community. So how we from the global and maybe I would add the regional level as well can and help uh, you know the, the the country level efforts in uh, supporting uh, national laws and policy development and implementation. Um, there's another question in relation to engagement with parliamentarians, in particular. Um, for the, the 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 case that was brought forward is one where the IDP bill has been presented by a minority member in the parliament. And you know what happens when the government has different priorities? Uh, how can we engage successfully parliaments in this in this? context and a question also in relation to the role of NGOs more specifically of course we heard about Ukraine but perhaps also in, in the case of Honduras and how can we um, were there any backlashes from the government for the involvement of civil society in some of these processes um, I must uh, also mention that Dr. Chaloka Beyani unfortunately had to leave the event, so I apologize for those questions that were directly uh, directed to him. Um, but in relation to South Sudan, we must mention this is something, there's a draft uh, law there that has been presented and it requires everybody's efforts now to, to be pushed forward, actually. So this is certainly something that we should, we will follow up on. Um, now, maybe Valerie first. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Martina and uh, other colleagues, panelists, and of course, participants for those interesting questions. I will be very brief because we have limited time. I will touch uh, on two questions. One is the support of international community and regional platforms and actors, definitely. Yes, make the most use of it. And actually coming from the field and having served four times as the cluster coordinator, now coming to the global uh, role, what my recommendation would be, don't be shy to reach out to uh, the GPC task team on law and policy, to the, the GPC task team on human rights engagement, to the GPC support cell. And we are uh, fortunate to have the, uh, all actors on this call. Please make use of their support of um, uh, and uh, we will be happy to discuss further. 
Uh, there are other, of course, means and channels uh, how to get uh, international attention and support. I would just briefly like to mention the Universal Periodic Review, which is a human rights mechanism, and where states are actually recommending other states under review some key uh, elements in relation to also, amongst other, uh, for example, legal uh, legal frameworks and necessary adjustments. So uh, there can support as needed as the human rights engagement task team, how to frame that, how to use and leverage the global advocacy networks, how to uh, lobby with other governments and state to support such uh, recommendations. I mentioned in my presentation use, uh, how useful it was to have the special reporter on IDPs come in a critical time to Niger and how it helped our uh, process. Again, I, uh, I think this would be very useful for other contexts as well, something to consider. But don't be shy also to uh, leverage other advocacy platforms and is uh, linked to, for example, sustainable development goals and broader than just the humanitarian uh, bubble in which we are uh, many times working. So uh, this was very briefly on the question of uh, international community. The same goes for regional platforms, so mainly in Africa and Latin America, on the role of the national um, uh, actors and NGOs. Our uh, experience was very positive because we had regular presentations in the cluster meetings where any uh, actor could participate and chair either uh, in the uh, during the meetings or, or bilaterally on confidential basis if needed. We did not face any backlash, but I would also recommend to reach out more proactively to civil society members that may be uh, their human rights actors that are working on the topic already for years, maybe. Uh, it may have uh, complementary skills, knowledge and experience to the one of uh, humanitarian actors and protection clusters. Um, thank you very much and I will stop here. Thanks so much Valerie for, for this. And now Lorena, maybe to you. Yes, um, on the first question I will add that in the, in the case of Honduras, having the governments like to be acknowledged and recognized. And I believe that the participation that Honduras with the protection of abandoned property had in the steering committee groups, they were in Geneva invited three or four times. That was amazing. It really worked because even though the government knew they had gaps uh, for them as a Central American country, being able to address the global community really, really supported the process. They were committed they already had the eyes of the global community uh, looking at them and they felt in a region in which Honduras, of course, is not the strongest uh, country being sitting at the table with Colombia and Mexico to talk about this for them was really important. So I believe that this is something that we need to leverage. We had this uh, massive structure of the GPC and all of the committees that they have. We need to have we need to use this better and bring our countries and our governments to showcase, showcast, whatever, uh, what they do. Uh, the other thing is that I believe the GP20, it's a strong tool, governments like that, because uh, they are showing what they do, they are being recognized. And I believe that what the gap that we have right now is linking the GP20 and all of the steering committee and so forth with governments and the high level panel. That for me would be the cherry on the top. How can we bring governments to address the high level panel to fill them really close? As uh, Valerie was mentioned, we were lucky enough to have Dr. Bayani in Honduras and the report that they did was one of the strongest advocacy tools that we have. If we were able to bring high level panel to a specific dialogues with these countries that are within their capacities trying to do something, I believe there is some leverage that we have and we need to use better. Um, on the second question of parliaments, that's really tough. I, um, this is one of the gaps that I feel we have. We don't know how to address the Senate. We don't know how to talk to politicians. We don't believe in them. We believe they are all corrupt. So we have the, the, like the um, cultural barriers that we need to be able to um, overcome and then find the tools to talk with politicians. And I believe this is something that we don't know how to do at the field level. So uh, how can we address that? We first need to improve our skills 
I believe that bringing uh, the, um, politicians to the field, building that relationship, showing them how people are facing specific protection gaps is the route in order to be able to make them sensible to the situation and then maybe not for sure we could be able to move parliaments but we need to gain some skills on that maybe this is one of the areas in which that question is very important and very difficult because i believe we don't have the tools or the skills to address parliaments uh, and legislative agendas within political will and finally on ngos um, the government in honduras was very strategic and very um, smart because they included ngos in the process from the onset of the process so when things didn't work it was everybody's fault it was not only the government because the, war, the government was working with ngos and the un agencies so we all felt that we were all uh, failing and we could not say it's your fault because we were all part of the interinstitutional commission so no there was no backlash on the other side on the on the opposite uh, they were uh, very strategic involving everyone for everything that we all felt that every time we felt it was uh, everybody's fault. So um, this was an interesting uh, approach from the government in Honduras. It's not what governments typically do. They do not want us to be so close or so involved. In Honduras, they did. And that was positive for them because we all felt that uh, it was everybody's fault. So this is what I would uh, share on the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorena. Everybody's fault, or everybody's married. <laughs> so that's. Uh, but this is a very, very helpful reflection from your side as well. And Elina, uh, would you like to add from your perspective as well? Thanks. Uh, thank you for your questions. I'd like to say that I totally agree with the first two uh, panelists regarding their answers for the first question. So actually, I have nothing to add, and I totally agree with them. Uh, regarding uh, the last two questions, I try to make my united answer. So um, what about parliament? Actually, here in Ukraine, R2P has quite a strict connections with the ministries and parliament and MPs. Actually, we have connections with them, and we can provide, when we share with them a lot of information, uh, primary information we collect from the from field, I mean, from the ground. So we share with them uh, all information regarding IDP's rights, all troubles, all problems IDP's face, uh, not only uh, regarding the freedom of movement now in quarantine time, but actually in the uh, field of property rights for compensation for damaged or destroyed property, or, or in the field of social benefits and pensions, and we have huge problems and challenges there in Ukraine. But uh, we negotiate a lot with the ministry with uh, other governmental structures and with MPs as well. We have uh, a new parliament since last year. It was newly elected, so it's only one year of MPs. Uh, and we negotiate a lot with the Com Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights, and uh, uh, which is uh, responsible for IDP policy as well. So we have connections and uh, we establish working groups with them. And uh, for instance, uh, me, I'm one uh, of the, I'm the member of one of working groups with the committee under the Committee of uh, Human Rights in uh, Ukrainian Parliament uh, in, the, in order to elaborate the law on compensation for property uh, damage or destroyed due to hostilities. So actually our experience is quite good here. Uh, I, but uh, what I have to say that it is really hard and complicated to negotiate to show all the problems IDP's faces uh, face, and it uh, in, it's uh, hard to uh, like um, to push uh, MPs or uh, functionaries or high public officials to understand where uh, that uh, IDP's rights are violated and why and where. So, but uh, we negotiate, we share all necessary information, we show them, we uh, write roadmaps, for instance, we even write bills and draft bills. And actually, this our contribution to the, uh, the policy making process in Ukraine in the field of IDP's rights. So I hope that I answered your two questions. Uh, my, my answer is united. So all channels, 
you have op actually you have all possibilities to introduce your um, interest in uh, policy decision making process and uh, you have to take uh, every possibility every chance to speak with them to negotiate with them to work with them uh, it's cooperation i i'd like to say that cooperation is a key word for uh, in this field not the conflict not the confrontation but the cooperation so take your chance and cooperate, even if you think that politicians are corrupted. We think in Ukraine as well, so we have the same opinion, but we don't, don't have other choice, choice but to cooperate with them and to show them all problems IDPs and war prisoners and conflict-affected persons face. It's our mission to help uh, persons, to help people to protect their rights. So we uh, take this flag and we take this mission on us. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much, Lina, for your uh, insights, the recommendations, uh, the, your, your compelling answer and call to action for all of us, which is perfect for our concluding uh, the event. But before we do that, I'd like to uh, leave the floor to uh, Corita Tassi, who's the regional, uh, the protection and gender thematic expert uh, for ECHO, uh, currently covering Latin America and the Caribbean region. And our thanks to you as to Lorena for getting getting up really early in order to participate with us in this discussion. And Corita, um, you're welcome um, to speak. Can you hear us well? Corita, can you... Can you please let us know on the chat if you can unmute yourself? You are unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Uh, can we turn on the camera maybe? Can I... No, we cannot hear you. Um, I'm not sure what that could be the issue, I don't know. Yeah. Um, maybe, yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Corinna. Okay, yes. great. Hold on clear. Please go ahead. <laughs> I think it was a problem with my headphones, sorry. And thank you very much. So thank you very much, Martina. Uh, I will try to be very, very briefly. Um, good morning, afternoon and uh, evening to you all. Uh, I'm Corita Tassi, I'm the eco protection and gender thematic expert currently uh, covering Latin America and the Caribbean and based in Panama. Today we had uh, a very rich and fruitful exchange uh, and I'm very happy that we had the opportunity to learn more about uh, these interesting experiences in Niger, Honduras and Ukraine, and I'm thankful that we also had the opportunity to discuss about the global engagement, political will, and the role of civil society. Um, I think we can say that echo key messages are very much in line with what we heard today. Um, first of all, uh, there is surely an urgency for more attention to law and policy related issues, and the need to develop those within a comprehensive and contextualized risk analysis. Um, the risk analysis should remain at the core of the protection strategy, both at protection cluster level, but also national and HCT level. And the analysis of the legal framework and the national legislation remains a crucial component to identify and address the context specific impediments and barriers for, uh, for people to access and enjoy their rights. Um, secondly, we should uh, reinforce evidence and interagency effort. So more data need to be collected, as already mentioned by the panelists. More information needs to be analyzed and more evidence needs to be uh, developed on how the lack of in, uh, or the incomplete or inadequate laws and policies actually affect the access and enjoyment of people's rights. And uh, it is in this direction that the role uh, of the cluster and all its members should be reinforced. Uh, this has to be a collective work, and uh, that includes the support of all cluster members, but I would even say of all the humanitarian actors, even beyond. And finally, our good friend and old friend, the Nexus, um, 
it remains absolutely essential to coordinate and join efforts with development actors and stakeholders. We all agree that governments have the primary responsibility in protecting their affected populations without discrimination and therefore uh, developing a national instrument, uh, whether a law or a policy, is a particularly important reflection of this crucial law and uh, this national responsibility. In this direction, uh, we think that protection classes have also, but not limited to, a crucial role in analyzing the state of play and the legal framework, or lack of it, building evidence-based advocacy, and uh, pushing towards change and monitoring it. And it remains so crucial that the accompaniment of the government, the coordinated engagement of all stakeholders at all levels, uh, uh, local, national, regional, and global, and the support uh, to law and policy making processes is jointly supported with development partners in order to find and achieve meaningful and sustainable solutions. Um, this um, Global Protection Cluster Annual Forum uh, uh, event gave us the opportunity to enrich uh, this discussion among all of us. And of course, uh, the active and diverse field participation provide the crucial insight and uh, for sure the concrete uh, examples of field realities and operational challenges. I'm sure this is just one step uh, on a long and very rewarding process, and uh, we really look forward to further working together on building a better environment for the protection of the affected population. Thank you very much, and over to you, Martina. Thank you very much, uh, Corita. Thank you. Summarized really well some of the key points that we will take with us from this event, um, as you said. But before I, I close, and it's about time we close, thanks so much for everyone for hanging in there until now. I just wanted to say a couple of things from our side as a task team. We are working on developing a few uh, tools that we hope will be helpful for you. And in particular, as it has been mentioned, a redesigned law and policy training package. Uh, that So please, if it comes to any request that you may have on capacity building please reach out to us and we will be happy to, to support um, a guidance and a checklist on the role of field protection clusters and AORs in relation to law and policy and in relation to this we, we are developing like a survey that we would like to share with you soon enough so um, um, a short one I promise but we really hope to receive your feedback on that because it will be very very uh, important um, and yes uh, just to let you also know that we noted all the questions and we will address them in a report um, and I even if we weren't able maybe to address today during the discussions but thank you so much there is a, an evaluation uh, link for the session today that has been shared on the chat and that you can find uh, um, but please uh, really feel free to get back to us uh, send us get in touch for any requests any questions do not hesitate we are there to help you and thanks again everybody for joining us today uh, bye